make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood, and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans, aim high, and hope and work, remembering that a noble, logical diagram, once recorded, will never die. But long after we are gone will be a living thing, asserting itself with ever-growing insistency. Remember that our sons and grandsons are going to do things that would stagger us. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. Think big. Daniel Burnham, Chicago Architect, 1864-1912 Chapter 16, Urban Planning, Who Controls the Turf 16.1, Introduction What are plans and how do they differ from policies? To be brief, we think of policies as rules for behaving and plans as the schematic of the desired outcome. This policies focus on the process and plans on the product. Planning itself doesn't create products, it only specifies how products should be created. The plan may say what should go where and which should come first. A plan is thus a blueprint for building something and a schedule for building it. Obviously, process affects product, and products shape future processes. Nevertheless, they are distinct things that are too often confused, especially by those who do policy. Plans are applied in all fields of human endeavor. We are most concerned about plans for transportation systems and networks and plans for cities and other places. Why are transportation plans and land use plans conducted by different professions, engineers and planners respectively? The chapter begins with some theories about how cities are organized and some discussion about how the positive becomes normative and vice versa, then explores the questions of who are the engineers, who are the planners, and what is the turf over which they contend. Sixteen point two The Urban Wheel. Early on, cities serving government, military, church, and or local market functions were scattered about. The commercial revolution pushed the growth of those suitably sited either for transfer of goods by water or to hinterland served by roads. Industrialization again pushed growth of those cities, as well as cities favorably sited relative to industrial resources such as coal. However, lack of internal transportation affected urban structure. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for instance, was not in early days, an integrated city as we observe today. Rather, it was a collection of interdigitated but largely independent mill towns and commercial centers. About 1910, the automobile population of cities began to grow very rapidly. As a result, several urban transportation planning activities were put in place. The stage through the 1920s for these activities was very rapid urban growth. The centralization of income and wealth in cities and the emergence of new concepts of planning and management especially the progressive government movement. There was the grand notion that scientific principles could be used in planning and management to achieve efficiency. By 1920, there were 6.7 million motorized vehicles in the United States, about 60% urban, with the number to grow to about 23 million by 1930. That was about four urbanites per vehicle. While there has been a great centralization of people from the countryside to metropolitan areas over most of the past century, The concern has been about suburbanization, movement from the core of the metropolis, the central city, to the suburbs. Suburbanization began early, notably with a streetcar, followed by the automobile. Central business district interests about accessibility to the core still dominate urban transport planning. Wheel-like radial routes and circumferential routes have been seen as the facility needed. The concentric circle theory of urban form consistent with those notions affected urban freeway planning. Wheel-like language described the streetcar city of 1920 very well. At the hub lies the CBD. Arteries of transportation radiate to the rim where housing is found. But what is became what ought to be. That is, descriptive language became normative language. Plans began to prescribe radial routes and circumferential routes. Architect and planner Daniel Burnham made the normative wheel the theme in his work and seems to have been the most responsible for the normative leap. In the general theory section of his 1905 study of San Francisco, he noted that the finest example of cities of the old world, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, Moscow, and London, consisted of concentric rings separated by boulevards with the smallest ring, inner circle, around the civic center. From the inner boulevard ran diagonal arterials. Having presented his findings about the finest European cities, he said, It is on this study that the proposed system of circulation for a larger and greater San Francisco is based. Ten years later, Werner Hegemann, a leading German planner who at one time worked on Oakland and Berkeley, 
undertook a critique of Burnham's theory. Burnham had given credit to architect Eugene Hennard's study of Paris. Indeed, Burnham used Hennard's figures in his report. But Hennard was dealing with the deficiencies in the Paris circulation system. His was hardly a scheme to be emulated. He went on to say that concentric boulevards were the result of the elimination of city walls as medieval cities expanded. Radial streets started out as paths from outside the city through city gates. Hegemann didn't reject concentric boulevards completely. He saw an inner concentric boulevard as distributing traffic downtown. He also thought radials were desirable. The cities of the future will resemble a wheel, with spokes radiating in all directions and the spokes connected by a network of cross streets. The radials would intersect the grid of the urban core. Hennard, who advocated traffic circles, pointed out that blocks formed between radial streets gradually shrink as radial streets approach the center of the city. This creates problems. There's more to Hegemon's and Hennard's work, and no one would say that either writer claimed a complete theory of streets and circulation. Burnham did, and he influenced U.S. practice. Burnham represented city beautiful thinking, and one might think that the rise of the city practical movement would have questioned Burnham's construct. It didn't. BPR chief and engineer Thomas MacDonald looked to Paris for inspiration and referred in 1937 to competent French engineers having planned a circular highway enclosing the city in radial arterials. The underlying soundness seems self-evident. Following MacDonald, the 1957 ASHO policy on arterial highways in urban areas referred to a wheel-like basic pattern. By 1950, there were three widely known theories or generalizations about urban form. Sociologist Ernest Burgess's concentric zone theory argued that cities grow outward in concentric circles through a process of invasion and replacement. Jobs and other central city functions would be located in the CBD, and these rings were the product of a competitive economic process. The rings were the commercial center, the zone of transition, working class residences, middle class residences, and the commuter zone. In contrast, economist Homer Hoyt proposed sector theory in 1939. Each sector or wedge of the city would have different economic activities. Hoyt made specific predictions of which type of activity would show up where in the city. Geographers Chauncey Harris and Edward Ullman suggested the polycentric or multiple nuclei theory. They noted that cities do not always have a single center, but many, many centers. Because of economies of agglomeration, similar activities group together in these many centers. The wheel metaphor seems most compatible with the concentric circle theory. Examining freeway plans, civil engineer and planner Edgar Horwood compared three cities in their radial, circumferential, and enclosed cellular areas. Horwood makes no normative claim for wheel-like designs. Even in the 21st century, U.S. cities are building rail transit networks focused on central business districts that have not added jobs in decades to serve central cities that are well off 1950 population highs. The power of the radial network is strong, as is the image of downtown. Today, there are two approaches to urban morphogenesis. One is an urban modeling approach in which rents and market activities steer toward a unique equilibrium pattern of activities. The other acknowledges increasing returns in the kind of processes studied by George Polia in the 1930s. Just as positive or descriptive models of how cities once worked became normative models of how cities should work, the increasing returns model imposes lock-in and suggests that investments shaped by normative models of how cities should work will affect how cities actually work. For more on normative methods and why they exist, see section 24.4.5. As should be apparent, we align with the increasing returns models, and network morphology is discussed further in section 25.4. Civil Engineering Who are the engineers? Engineers are those who use ingenuity to create new technologies. The first searching questions about the social role of engineers were in the non-civil engineering fields. Most of those engineers worked for private organizations. Were the engineers responsible just to the organization that employed them? Or as professionals, did they have responsibilities to society as a whole? This debate reemerged in the late 19th century, when the social role of big business was at question. Revisiting interests held by James Watt and other engineer scientists of the times in social matters, interests dampened by the excesses of the French Revolution. This was the trust-busting era. The civil engineers were not much involved in that debate. Civil engineering was, even then, an old field and had not much in common with the new field such as electrical engineering. There were about 2,000 civil engineers in the United States during the period of canal building. The ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, was established in 1852. 
The mining, electrical, and mechanical organizations were not established until the 1880s, and most other engineering professional organizations were not established until the 20th century. Most civil engineers worked for government, construction, and consulting organizations. Civils were not big business payroll employees. Finally, the civils had a sense of social role, for they were heavily involved in the emerging conservation movement at the onset of the 20th century. The civil engineers did no formal joining with those debating. For instance, when Carnegie gave money for a headquarters building for the engineering societies in 1903, the civil engineers elected not to join others in a unified headquarters. This was an important matter, for the societies were seeking strength through unification. The matter of just what social responsibility meant got messy when Frederick W. Taylor, a mechanical engineer, began to study engineering efficiency in manufacturing, for example, using time and motion studies. Frank Gilbreth, of Cheaper by the Dozen fame, and others rapidly implemented Taylor's notions. Why did things get messy? Taylor's notions gave engineers the tools and concepts so that they could be the best managers. The problem was that of reconciling the best manager role, scientific management, with democracy and obligations beyond the place of employment. The debate continued strong until the 1930s. As late as 1933, Thorsten Veblen saw the engineers as the real social revolutionaries. But the debate began to peter out. Perhaps President Hoover's move from hero to villain in the public eye was a factor. Hoover, an engineer himself, had been a champion of the engineers' views. Perhaps the Great Depression found engineers void of usable ideas. Sixteen point four City Planning Who were the planners? Planning emerged from the design professions, engineering, architecture, and landscape architecture. However, as the profession of planning has matured, it has slowly been captured by the process professions, law, policy analysis, management, economics. Although city planning has ancient roots, it came into its own in the first decades of the 20th century. Sometimes sponsored by city governments and sometimes sponsored by groups of concerned citizens, at the turn of the 20th century, planning was highly aesthetic in orientation. The reasons seem numerous. The classical education of many social and economic leaders with interest in the architecture of Rome, Greece, and Egypt. The impact of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair with its emphasis on civic ideals and the view that beautiful environments would uplift men's souls. So, cities planned and built great regional parks, parkways, ornate civic centers, and museums. Frederick Law Olmsted, Daniel Burnham, and Arnold Brunner were leaders in that City Beautiful movement. The City Beautiful movement was badly damaged, although not dead, by the end of the first decade of the century. What seemed to have stopped it was the realization that in spite of monuments, haphazard growth was leading to many thorny infrastructure problems, and that lofty ideals and monuments were not as relevant as were plans and designs to efficiently control growth and deploy needed facilities. Actually, the conflict between the practical and the aesthetic in design was long-standing. Pierre Lanfant, 1754-1825, for example, found his plan for radial streets in Washington, D.C., reflecting a quasi-organic Baroque city notion, in conflict with Thomas Jefferson's gridiron pattern of roads, an ordered city. L'Enfant was later fired over an environmental conflict, trying to run New Jersey Avenue through the newly built house of Daniel Carroll, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Matters such as these are discussed in several histories of city planning. The City Beautiful versus City Practical, or City Efficient, debate of the early 1900s so advocates of ideas debating and pushing their worldviews. Frederick Law Olmsted was one of the more successful of the former. As a landscape consultant, he produced designs for dozens of cities, often working with others. In addition to producing plans that advocated his concepts, he debated in the literature. In contrast, the advocates of rational planning mainly did not use the medium of plans, with Nelson Lewis a notable exception. Rather, they wrote. The present incarnation of U.S. city planning emerged in the state of New York. In 1926, the state legislature passed a bill enabling cities to engage in a planning process with the elements of that process spelled out in the legislation. Cities were to adopt official maps, create planning boards, improve and maintain records of plats, and undertake zoning. The city planning movement affected transportation. The New York case is illustrative. The Regional Plan of New York and its Environs, produced by the Regional Plan Association, or RPA, an elitist non-governmental group that had major roles in urban street and transit affairs, pushed the legislation. The argument for passage of the legislation was mainly transportation in context. The RPA argued that something had to be done to coordinate street development, manage the differences between public and private streets, and assured adequate street widths and street layouts. 
issues of zoning, plats, and so on had somewhat a secondary role, and they came in because of their transportation relevancy. Transportation questions were also highlighted as other states passed enabling acts for city planning, and most of the legislation referred to transportation and land use planning. So transportation was an important matter in the genesis of city planning organizations. The rapid adoption of city planning enabling acts by the states was assisted by work at the U.S. Department of Commerce. In the late 1920s, the U.S. Department of Commerce published a model enabling act for planning, created a Bureau of Planning, and issued publications to assist the states and cities in undertaking planning. There was a second way that transportation steered the development of city planning. Large cities began as a collection of neighborhoods, and in the early days, these were mostly self-contained. There might be a mill or some other type of employment opportunity, with workers and managers housed nearby. Shopping and recreational opportunities were also close. Horse trams and then streetcars changed the scale of those neighborhoods, and they also enabled specialized downtown functions, shopping, banking, and so on. Next, the automobile brought a major change. It offered an order of magnitude more mobility than precursor technology and enabled the development of residential areas some distance from workplaces, the suburbanization of workplaces, and many other changes. The effect was to enable the development of areas with relatively homogeneous land uses. Homogeneous land use was particularly valued for residences because individuals tend to select residential sites according to peer group criteria. Additionally, the externalities of noise, smoke, and so on associated with some land uses are particularly obnoxious in residential areas. Zoning took on the job of controlling externalities, and zoning and land use control began to be the central preoccupation of urban planning agencies. In addition to supporting the emergence of relatively homogeneous land uses, there was direct consideration of transportation and planning agency efforts. First, a land use may have undesirable externalities because of traffic generation and the loads imposed on parking facilities. Planners and planning commissions gave much attention to these matters. Second, there were our transportation planning or design facets to subdivision development. Some designs provide better sequestering of neighborhoods than others and fit the overall travel pattern in the city better than others. City planners have long attended to these matters, initially through the hierarchy of roads and now under the guise of traffic calming. Third, many city planning departments did engage in citywide transportation planning and extended their interest to facilities such as parkways, expressways, and freeways. The early days of city planning saw a priority given to creation of the official map and zoning regulations. This was a time-consuming problem because it required the coordination of existing records, as well as a fair amount of legwork. Concerns about lack of coordination of infrastructure that lay behind the creation of planning activities tended to diminish as the Great Depression came along and growth ceased in most cities. Also, in undertaking transportation work, there was the potential of turf battles with existing public works agencies, and planning agencies were likely to be leery of these. Historically, when turf battles emerged, the engineering agency was usually the winner. The planning professional was overwhelmed by the technical arguments of the city engineers. However, this has diminished in recent years as environmental agencies have established technical arguments that transportation engineers can't counter. Ultimately, it becomes a question of values as much as of facts, and preferences of cities and decision makers have changed over time as transportation has matured. Even though transportation didn't enter much in the early planning agency work, it was on the agenda. It was on the minds of early public works engineers who worked in city planning, such as Harlan Bartholomew. With the resurgence of city growth after World War II, some city planning agencies began to make large plans for major transportation facilities. This aspect of their transportation initiatives, however, was co-opted by the federal government in metropolitan area planning, a matter that we will discuss. Sixteen point five city planning versus transportation planning. As with most public works, the technical planning turf in transportation largely belongs to engineers. Planning applied elsewhere, for instance, health services, educational services, land use belongs to others. There's nothing surprising about that. Planning is organized in knowledge areas, and each domain holds special advantages embodied in notions of processes, available techniques, and professional traditions. Knowledge areas also have resources of institutional and financial arrangements. So as expected, medical or paramedical professionals do health facilities planning and macroeconomists play prominent roles in national economic planning. We have observed that engineers played key roles in the development of urban planning and that transportation considerations loomed large in the creation of urban planning. For example, the first national conference on city planning had the title 
National Conference on City Planning, and the problems of congestion. Things have changed since then. Engineers are only tangentially involved in city planning. Transportation planning, the engineer's domain, is a thing apart from city planning. So we have two questions. Why did civil engineers give up involvement in city planning, and why did urban transportation planning become an engineering planning activity apart from city planning? Perhaps engineers gave up interest in urban planning after they found that rational analysis failed when applied to social problems. Alternatively, perhaps the pendulum had swung too far from aesthetics, as embodied in the City Beautiful movement, and engineers' talents missed the mark of the middle ground. Even so, engineers continued in the transportation planning field because of its technical content and the need for rational analysis. Those explanations must have some truth in them, yet are insufficient. They beg the question of how the fields of urban planning and urban transportation planning got claimed and divided. Moreover, this division is not permanent. Fields encroach upon one another. Our second question concerns the extent to which the power of concepts, memes, explained turf wars and their outcomes. Is there a Darwinian survival of the fittest at work? Do the most appropriate concepts and techniques devour less appropriate ones? Our questions are large ones. We will deal with them by restricting their scope, discussing rational analysis applied to urban planning. We will see that the engineers gained and then gave up the turf. We think that was not so much the result of a Darwinian competition between concepts and techniques as it was the engineers' views of their social role. Rational analysis refers to the application of science and its techniques to practical problems. This is analysis in the tradition of Galilei Galileo, 1564-1642. Galileo gave attention to topics in structural engineering, but the development of the rational analysis tradition in civil engineering is usually dated from John Smeaton's work, 1724-1794. Smeaton is regarded as the father of British civil engineering and thus the grandfather of U.S. civil engineering. Careful problem definition experimentation, and testing, and calculations using physical laws marked Smeaton's work. Above, we refer to the conflict between Jefferson's rational analysis and L'Enfant's aesthetic design work, and also to the grand design's city-beautiful mode of architecture-based urban planning. The city-beautiful movement in urban planning gave way to rational planning in the early part of the 1900s. One has to conclude that the debate was over the power of concepts, but perhaps the real issue was that of the image of what ought to be done. The early 1900s saw the birth of the progressive movement, and rational planning gained the turf because it was consistent with the progressive movement, the idea that things ought to be done in a progressive way. The debate is well documented, and some references to the debate were given earlier in the chapter. Ford states the rational case, and Olmsted states the design case. The high ground, so to speak, was taken by Nelson P. Lewis, who, more than any other person, argued that planning should focus on the physical facilities of the city, and the planning and deployment of those facilities should not use and the planning and deployment of those facilities should use sound engineering. His argument coupled nicely with the then growing interest in the application of science to business. Human factors and industrial engineering began to permeate industry. In addition, it coupled with the progressive movement in city politics. Concerned publics were beginning to argue against the politicizing of urban governments and for the use of experts to manage and operate technical programs and for civil service-like arrangements for managers of other programs. Because of these couplings, Lewis's influence on city planning was enormous. In spite of these developments, engineers did not retain urban planning. They withdrew to public works. The Lewis tradition passed to urban planners. Was the engineer's withdrawal forced by the lack of efficacy of engineering approaches, or did engineers give up the turf because it did not fit their sense of social role? An argument that's an alternative to the lost interest in the social role argument begins with a hypothesis that civil engineering concepts and techniques were inappropriate to the social role in the urban planning context. To what extent do concepts or paradigms from different fields clash, with the stronger driving out the weak, as in the world of Darwin? Rational analysis is beloved by civil engineers, and one may say that it obviously doesn't fit artificial or social technical systems. That may seem true, but when one looks at what is called rational analysis, much of it is empirical. Empirical statements can be made about anything, urban land use just as well as the strength of concrete. One might say that engineers are nerds or geeks and don't fit the kind of social situations found when one is in social roles. That's true overall, but professionals self-select their fields of specialization. They want fields that fit their self-perceptions. So if civil engineering had a social role, then those who were politically effective would populate it. We have a perhaps civil engineers lost interest in a social role conjecture, 
The alternatives that rational analysis doesn't fit social roles and that civils have the wrong personality seem weak. So we have the not very strong conclusion that the civils lost interest in urban planning because they backed away from social roles. In applied fields such as engineering and planning, outside criteria of success or applicability apply to a greater degree than they do in the sciences. For instance, irrigation engineering was established as a division in civil engineering in 1922. Outside criteria at the time said that irrigation was a great thing. Times have changed. Irrigation engineering still exists, but it is retracted and has been encroached on by others. We will explore the temporal pattern of tasks as the system is created and deployed. Product engineering gets attention early on, for instance, designing bridges or ships. Process technology gets attention later, for instance, how to plan or construct systems. As a system moves to maturity, standardized products are tailored to their markets, market channeling. Today, most transportation systems are well deployed and mature. As seen by outsiders, and too many insiders, the task is market channeling. For instance, get the capacities of the traffic signal system just right, balance the fine detail of airport capacity with demand, improve truck service schedules, and rebuild container yards. But in a mature system, these are not as important as the tasks of managing a static system, and economists, entrepreneurs and managers, and financiers, rather than engineers, are experts on the management of such systems. Given a static production set, certainly the applicability of economics is strengthened versus engineering. Those who say that present problems are not so much engineering as they are social and economic are, in our judgment, not so much commenting on the changing outside environment as they are on the state of the system. The system is in a phase where the comparative advantage goes from engineers who are good at designing physical infrastructure systems to those who know about management and how to handle social systems. Sixteen point six other varieties of transportation planning. It should be remarked now that what we have discussed to this point is not the whole story. First, we should remember that a role continued during that period for civic planning groups. The Metropolitan Housing and Planning Council in Chicago, the Regional Plan Association in the New York City area, and SPUR in the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, for example. Some varieties of transportation planning were not mentioned. There were antecedents for planning from the 19th century. Small project planning know-how emerged as early ports, toll roads, canals, and railroads were developed. Engineering consultants did the planning, often they took part in construction. As the needs and opportunities for larger projects emerged, for example, the Suez Canal, the Sault Ste. Marie, Union Pacific Railroad, ports to accommodate larger liners, projects were larger in scope. More complicated engineering designs were required, as were more complicated fiscal and management plans. Project analysis techniques were improved. Systematic work was begun on the interrelations of transportation and other activities, for example, by researchers interested in location theory. There were attempts at systematic construction of intercity networks in the United States, Gallatin's and Clay's plans, for instance. In Ireland, the first flow map was developed. Cities had surveys well before they had plans, as we think of them now. New York's grid street system is one of the early systematic attempts that laid out a grid not only for present construction, but for future development. Though grids can be traced back to Roman, Greek, Chinese, and Indus Valley civilizations, among others, and in the United States to early settlements like Philadelphia and Savannah and the Northwest Ordinances. The urban railroad problem was an important variety of planning. On the passenger side, there was an effort to coordinate service and promote union stations, see section 8.4. With the growth of the city and the development of truck service, downtown teaming yards became obsolete. Also in the freight area, there were problems of coordinating movements among railroads and congestion caused by the operation of freight trains in crowded urban areas. Effort was given to the planning and deployment of railroads that would circumvent urban areas, belt lines, and or provide better coordination of existing lines and facilities. Urban airports started out as small facilities located on the fringe of the city. Cities grew and larger facilities were needed, and planning and development activities commenced during the 1930s after service became available from DC-3 type aircraft. The Hopkins Airport in Cleveland was a development that many cities attempted to emulate. Maritime port development was also on the agenda of a few cities. By the 1920s, inland waterway traffic was dwindling away and there was not much interest in inland ports except for those in the Great Lakes. Traffic later expanded in the 1940s and 50s, as larger dams and locks were constructed. Although there was congestion around maritime ports, especially those with closely placed single or finger piers, 
Technology development of maritime transportation stagnated and port development problems were not on many agendas. Where there was a demand for development, much was accomplished. Finally, there is urban transit planning. During the first two-thirds of the 20th century, not much new urban public transport was deployed, although much was deprecated. As shown in Chapter 14, fleet conversion issues, financing issues, and ownership issues, which were as much policy as planning, dominated the conversation. Sixteen point seven discussion. The operating expenses from bad railroad location come by a gentle but unceasing ooze from every pore which attracts no attention. Errors are not likely to be discovered. The consciousness that there is a danger of error becomes dulled. A. M. Wellington, 1906. It is not too early to begin to forge templates for critiques. We use the word templates in the plural because planning is diverse. The word template suggests something with a shape or figure in which things are to be fitted, and we have in mind criteria about how planning puts things together and fits the situation. Many endeavors link a perceived opportunity with a development. The clients who used the plan and gained or lost from its implementation, and the sponsors who wanted it were the same. If we ask, did it lead to action, the combination of client and sponsor into a single individual organization greatly increases the probability that a plan will be implemented. It should be noted that the words client and sponsor make useful metaphors. Who was the client for a transportation and traffic plan of the 1910s and 20s? The immediate clients were the sponsor in the city council that would implement programs. But the urban population should be counted as a client too. Does a plan meet the needs of clients and sponsors? That would seem to be the question that precedes the did it lead to action question. Implementation is one criterion. A plan is implemented. We then ask, is the result successful? That question has a relative to what content. Whether plans are financially successful depends on their context. Many projects were undertaken as systems were deployed. Rapid growth was underway. Because of market growth, success would be expected. How could the planner go wrong? However, the fact is that a lot of plans were accepted and projects implemented that were not financially successful, rail and port facilities in particular, and also some canal and toll road developments. In a network system where there are cross-subsidies among links, Lack of success may not be obvious. What is, a lot that were not successful? We've never seen numbers and they would be difficult to obtain, but the literature is full of references to failures. In some canal and port instances, the engineering aspects of plans resulted in unexpected expenses and or shortfalls in performance. The lack of enough inexpensive water for canal operations is an example. These instances do not seem to have been numerous. We would not expect them to be, for there was a buildup of technical expertise as project followed project. Most failures appear to have resulted from the project scope of planning and thus the lack of system considerations. Development of a network link, say a rail route from here to there, or a transshipment node, say a port, might seem favorable in a project scope context, but that may prove not to be successful because of changes elsewhere in the system. That is clearly the case for ports, where projects were implemented although developments elsewhere did not bode well for the implemented projects. Sometimes system scoped considerations boded success. Consideration of how the Suez Canal would interact with sailing routes around the Horn said it would certainly be successful. There are dynamic system considerations. As the market becomes saturated and as most opportunities have been taken up, success comes harder and harder. The presence of agglomeration economies and route and note economies of scale works two ways in this situation. First, existing competing facilities may have scale economies supporting their viability. Pre existing agglomeration economies and or route economies of scale may so enhance competing facilities as to make the outlook for the new facilities bleak. Second, projects late in the game often incorporate superior and expensive attributes in order to lower unit costs. To get those lower unit costs, high volumes of use are needed. That's the case today with high-speed rail schemes. This creates a risky situation. Economies of agglomeration refer to the accumulation of advantages. The early development and activities of the ports in the Bay Area, for example, enhance the growth of banking, brokerage, strip repair, freight forwarders, insurance, maritime management, and other activities. The advantages held by the port facilities were in turn enhanced by those activities. The discussion had emphasized scale and agglomeration economies, but the point is that life cycle dynamics affect the likelihood of planning and project success. The scorecard on system scoping of planning shows mixed results. There are several ways that we can use the word system. First, one might say that we have a system plan if we deal with a hard facility and soft management, financing, control, etc., 
aspects of what is to be done. Many plans achieve that system view, although what are called plans often deal only with specific subsystems. We can also ask if a plan dealt with the mode of as technological system. That is, did it treat guideway fixed facilities, equipment, and operation aspects of the mode? The railroads did, but other plans mainly focused on guideways, canals, dock facilities, roads, and so on. Equipment and operations were, and are, taken as givens. Plans were mainly link or node scope. As rail service matured, questions of viable subnetworks owned and operated by individual firms weren't handled very well. The introduction of Interstate Commerce Commission style control was an attempt to control behavior using common law precepts. The question, how do we manipulate the network so as to manage problems, wasn't raised until 1920. A project here affects things there. More generally, the development of the railroads affected the fates of canals and toll roads. The latter were orphaned. Planning was and remains almost universally mode specific. While it promotes development here, it fails to ensure graceful decline there. In general, plans were made for projects and not for evolution of systems. It was a project rather than a pathway stance. Some project decisions thus constrain development pathways.